this week's Torah portion, one of the better known parshiot in our tradition, begins, Ele toldot Noach. This is the story of Noah. Noah ish tzadik tamim haya bedorotav. Noah was a righteous man. He was blameless in his generation. Eta Elohim hitalech Noach. And Noah walked with God. And it was good that Noah walked with God. It was good that he was blameless in his age. And it was good that he was a righteous man because no one else was. According to our tradition, Noah was the only righteous man of his generation. Everyone else was pretty much awful, gross, disgusting. Our Torah portion this week tells us that the whole world had become corrupt. And the great medieval commentator Rashi tells us that the Hebrew word vatishachet refers to a particular kind of corruption, erva, usually translated as licentiousness, sexual depravity. And Rashi notes that according to the Midrash, erva so offends God that it leads ultimately to indiscriminate punishment, the end of all flesh, a punishment that is meted out to good people and to wicked people alike. In the words of the Midrash, it's something that horeget tovim viraim. It's something that led God to call for the death of both the righteous and the wicked. What a Parsha for this week. Like many of you, I've been reading one hashtag Me Too story after another on Facebook. Friends, classmates from college and rabbinical school, colleagues sharing horrifying stories of aggression, discrimination, humiliation, degradation, and violence. Details of Harvey Weinstein's behavior and the, degree, and the degree to which so many were complicit in it continue to emerge. And it's a type of corruption. It's a type of corruption that we see in this town, a type of erva in our town's biggest industry. And of course, more broadly, in the whole wide world, that is gross and disgusting and degrading and nauseating. How should we respond? What should we do? How can we make things better? Although I once had a mother and I have a sister, a spouse, and three daughters, it's very difficult for me to relate personally to so many of the stories that I read. But I found it helpful to simply try to listen to the experience of others. And in yesterday's New York Times, Margaret Wrinkle shared a moving piece about some of her own experiences. A few years back, she found herself sitting around the kitchen table at home with her sons, and the subject of travel came up in the conversation, and her boys asked her why it is that she had never done a backpacking trip across Europe like their father had, and he told them stories about it, and they wanted to know why she hadn't done the same. And here's what Margaret shared with her sons. It's dangerous for a woman to camp alone, I said at the table that night. There are women who do it, but I'm not that brave. My children, she continued, grew up with stories of their father's adventures, they did not grow up with stories of mine. I didn't tell them the story of the 16-year-old family friend who babysat while his parents and mine went out to dinner the year I was 11, how he followed me around the apartment tugging on my blouse and telling me I should take it off, pulling at the elastic waistband of my pants and telling me I should take them off, how I finally locked myself in my bedroom and didn't come out till my parents came home. 
I didn't tell my children the story of walking with my friend to the town hardware store when we were 14. I didn't tell them that my friend used her babysitting money to buy a screwdriver and a deadbolt lock to keep her older brother out of her room at night. I didn't tell my children the story of my first job, the job I started the week I turned 16, and how the manager kept making excuses to go back to the storeroom whenever I was at the fry station, how he would squeeze his corpulent frame between the counter and me, dragging his sweaty crotch across my rear end on each trip. There's nothing unusual about these stories, she continued. They are the ho-hum, everyday experiences of virtually every woman I know. And such stories rarely get told. There will never be a powerful social media movement that begins, Today I ate breakfast. Or, Today my dog pooped and I cleaned it up. Or, Today I washed my hair with shampoo, the same one I've been buying since 2006. We tell the stories that are remarkable. Stories that are surprising, unexpected. The, qu- the quotidian doesn't make for a good tale. And maybe that's why the avalanche of stories on Twitter and Facebook this week have been so powerful. It started on October 5th when the New York Times first broke the story of accusations of sexual harassment against the Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. But it became a juggernaut 10 days later when the actress Alyssa Milano tweeted, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write hashtag me too as a reply to this tweet. Within minutes, hashtag me too was all over Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram over 500,000 times on Twitter and 12 million times on Facebook in the first 24 hours. And the deluge shows no sign of slowing. The numbers keep ticking up as women tell the stories of men who use their power to overwhelm or coerce them. There is a terrible corruption in the world. In this week's Torah portion, God gets so fed up with it that she decides to start all over, to destroy her creation and begin again. Our Parsha tells us that Noah was indeed righteous, But he is actually criticized by the rabbis who contrast Noah's behavior with the behavior of Abraham in the following Parsha, the one we'll read next week. When Noah is told that God wishes to destroy the world, he says nothing. He builds the ark and he saves his family as he's commanded to do and he saves the animals as he's commanded to do, but he does nothing to address the core issue. The fundamental problem, the corruption in the world that so angered God. And maybe that's one of the lessons for us. It's not enough to be upright in our own behavior. Of course, each of us at work and at home must behave according to the highest standards of our tradition. And we should be particularly careful not to degrade, humiliate, or harass ever. But our tradition requires us to go farther. We have to actively work to build communities where the norms and standards of upright behavior in this regard are widely embraced so that we can build together a world where no 14-year-old woman would need to put a deadbolt on her bedroom door. On a closed Facebook page for Reform Rabbis, Over the past few days, I've read many stories of female colleagues across the country who have felt uncomfortable in their own synagogues because congregants or co-workers had made comments about their dress or their appearance. And they shared stories of being hugged or kissed at the Oneg when they didn't always feel comfortable with that kind of touch. One of my colleagues, a former student of mine at HUC, wrote, Some of the harassment that causes female rabbis on this board to post hashtag me too takes place in our synagogues, sometimes from colleagues and other times from lay leaders or congregants. We need our male colleagues, she wrote, to be our partners in changing the culture in our communities. We can 
and we must do better. And it shouldn't take an explosive story like this to inspire us to try to make a difference. We have to help each other as a community to do better. If you didn't have the chance to hear Rabbi Noble's powerful and moving High Holy Day sermon about gender violence, you can find a video of it on our website. And if you did hear it, I urge you to watch it again now and think about it in light of what we've seen over the past few weeks. And if you feel comfortable doing so, I invite you to share any of your experiences and any suggestions you have about how we can make this sacred space more comfortable for you and about how we can work together to change things in this city of angels where so many of those awful stories took place and are taking place probably right now. And then we have to change things more broadly so that the violence and degradation, the terrible corruption that led God to want to destroy the whole wide world will become a distant memory so that no woman or man will ever again have to say, hashtag me too.